To the more or less official bio, Christopher Hitchens was born in Portsmouth, England in 1949, though he became an American citizen like seven weeks ago. In between, he's been a columnist at Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, The Nation, Slate, and Free Inquiry. Additionally, he's an occasional contributor to other publications, including Slate, Granta, and The Wall Street Journal. With a political and personal vantage that's, let's just call it, aggressively defiant of binary characterization, it's easier to ask where his work has not appeared or might not be welcome. Recent books written or edited include 1995's The Missionary Position, Mother Teresa in Theory and Practice, 2000's No One Left to Lie to, The Values of the Worst Family, that same year's Unacknowledged Legislation, Writers in the Public Sphere, 2001's The Trial of Henry Kissinger, and Letters to a Young Contrarian, and 2002's Orwell's Victory. It's provocative stuff, especially the one about Mother Teresa. But none has met the standard set by God is not great, how religion poisons everything, which is why we've waited until this moment to have him on the town hall stage. That last bit is completely untrue, and we're extremely grateful he's here tonight to provoke us too, especially since until earlier today he was expecting a debate tonight with a partner who had to withdraw at the last minute. So please offer an extra warm welcome to Christopher Hitchens. Thank you, Ware, very much for that suspiciously terse introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, for coming. I'm going to take this, uh, a few ground rules, why not? I'm going to take your presence here, not as a compliment to my blue eyes and my sexual charisma, <laughs> though warm thanks to all those who were magnetized here by either of those but as a tribute to the importance of the subject, which I think has revived in a major way. Um, I take the view that people like yourselves come to events like this not just to listen, but to contribute and to engage, and so I'll, I'll be as brief as I dare be in my opening, and then make myself your prisoner, as it were, or your guest, if you like. Um, and my ground rule is essentially, that I don't want to have it said ever that I left with any question unanswered. Um, and I, I really do mean that sincerely. And I ask you only to bear in mind uh, the imminence of the cocktail hour. Um, OK. And I did think that there'd be someone else here, uh, as there has been everywhere else I've been on this tour since we started in Little Rock about six months ago and went on a wonderful swing through Dixie, where I wish you could all have been there. Um, but. <laughs> and seen the pinched faces of the Baptists, uh, <laughs> the pinched and flabby faces of the faithful. Okay, so I'm going to have to question myself, which I've never done before, and is an act of, if, of what I call, in early stage of the book, um, solipsism. What do I mean by solipsism? Well, it's a good way into the argument, actually. Um, who here has a cat or a dog? Just, you may wonder why I'm asking you this. Surprisingly few people, but you've all run into dogs and cats. Okay. <laughs> Um, what is the world view of the cat? The world view of the cat, no, start with the dog. What's the world view of the dog? The dog is given by you food, shelter, water, love, affection, and it thinks you're God. The cat is given food, warmth, shelter, and love, by, it thinks it's God. Religion makes the following appeal to us, which is why I say it poisons everything, because it goes to the, the, the deep nature of our self-respect and our humanity and our integrity. It makes the following bid to us. It says, you are born sinful. You're born guilty. You're guilty of crimes that were committed before you were born. You are not, not able to evade them. Your sin is original. You're made from dust, or in the Quran, from a clot of blood. Uh, your creator is not in a very good mood with you, and there's no reason why he should be, given what a uh, piece of excrement you basically are. <laughs> That's the masochistic element of it. Um, but after this thoroughgoing abjection, thoroughgoing demand that you throw aside all your self-respect, you're told there is, however, some redeeming news. 
The universe is designed with you in mind. The cosmos cares what happens to you. And if you will continue to abject yourself, like a serf, in front of God, uh, you may hope for the forgiveness of sins, uh, for eternal life, and for a divine plan. In other words, the maximum appeal to the abject, the servile in you, and the maximum appeal to the self-centered and the egomaniac. Not a very wholesome way to begin a discussion about the main questions, such as why are we here, who are we, what are we here for, what is the just city, how would it look like, what is the meaning of life. It's begun by a horrible lecture from a dictator. And you're then further told that if you do not bow the knee to a celestial dictatorship, unalterable, unchangeable, unappealable to, if you don't believe in that, you would have no means of telling right from wrong. How would you know how to do the right thing or avoid the wrong if you were not being told by a celestial dictatorship? Once again, an absolutely central attack on any concept that we might have of our own integrity, dignity, and self-respect. How would Huck Finn know? Admittedly, he's a fictional character, but then so are most of the people I'm going to be discussing, from Moses onwards. <clears throat> How does Huck Finn know that he's not to betray his friend Jim? He's not to give him back. He's not to give him up to the people who are hunting for him. How does Mark Twain know that we will like Huck when he refuses this? What does Huck know? The law is against him. The church is against him. All the preachments of religion and customary law are against him. He thinks that if he refuses the demand to give up his slave friend, he's going to go straight to hell. That's what he thinks, but he still does the right thing. As we might all hope to do, as we must all hope to do, if we were tested much less than that. It's innate in us. Religion gets its morals from us. We know what the right thing is without being told by a celestial dictatorship. If it were otherwise, this is why I say I'm an anti-theist, not an atheist. If it were otherwise, what would the situation be? every one of our waking and sleeping thoughts would be under permanent surveillance at all times from the moment of our conception, according to some at any rate, certainly birth, until not just when we died, because that's when the real fun would begin. <laughs> now, it's as if those who wish it to be true, which I do not, you can be an atheist and wish that there was a God, Many atheists I know do wish it was true. Why do I not? Because I don't want to live in a celestial North Korea. <clears throat> I'm one of the few people who's been to, uh, as a writer, to North Korea and Iran and Iraq too, to all the axis of evil countries in the last few years. In, when I was young and was told that this is what paradise will be like, you get to praise God all the time, forever, and continue thanking him for everything he's doing for you, sometimes with the aid of musical instruments. <laughs> but that's the thing, that's what paradise would be like, and everlasting praise. I used to think, sounds like hell to me. <laughs> but I also wondered, what would it be like? I couldn't quite picture it. Um, an attempt is made in the movie Bedazzled, the first version, to try and convey how ghastly it would be. Well, now I know. I've been to a state where there's worship from dawn till dusk and thanking for everything you've got every tiny crumb, and there's what you get, too, is the tiny crumb. Nothing but thanks, nothing but praise. It's a state where, uh, not everybody knows this, Kim Jong-il is not the absolute dictator of North Korea. He's only the head of the party and of the North Korean army. The head of the state, the president, is his late father, who's been dead for some 15 years, Kim Il-sung. He's still the president, and he's the president, if you pardon the expression, for life, even though he's... <laughs> as it were, passed on, ceased to be, joined the choir in Visibule, <laughs> turned up his toes, he's an ex-president. Um, you could call it a necrocracy. Um, <clears throat> a thanatocracy, a mausolocracy. And it's also, you'll notice, just one short of a trinity, because the son is the reincarnation of the father. That's what it would be like if this horrible Bronze Age Palestinian myth was true. Unending, eternal, unchallengeable, unchangeable slavery. Who 
wants it to be true. That's my first question to myself. I'll answer it later. And to you, and to you, since I haven't got a debate partner, and to you, ladies and gentlemen, why would anyone want it to be true? If I don't remember to ask myself, isn't secular dictatorship sometimes just as bad? If I don't remember to ask myself this, promise me one of you will, because we can't skip that point. Okay. Um, why is it wonderful to be here in Seattle and in North America having this discussion at this moment? Because everybody in America believes that everybody else is a strong believer. Everybody believes the opinion polls that say everyone else goes to church and believes in Satan more than they believe in Darwin. Everyone else thinks you can't run for office unless you bow the knee. And this is not true, and your presence here partly materializes my belief that it isn't, as, as did my swing through the South, where thousands of people came to each stop and all looked around themselves thinking, God, I thought I was the only atheist in this town until I got here. <laughs> we had to move out of the bookstore in North Carolina into a church to fill up the <laughs> overstore. <laughs> and the pastor said to me, he said, I shouldn't be telling you this. This made my day, I believe. He said, I shouldn't be telling you this. This damn church has never been this full. <laughs> <clears throat> And North Carolina can be a hard road to hoe for, a, for an unbeliever, I can, I'm here to tell you, but it's not that tough. And when I thought, because the Lord sent me the death of Jerry Falwell that week, <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm going to say what I think about him. Um, and I made a few comments about his, his uh, the origin of his ghastly career as a segregationist and a defender of racism. Um, about his, his vulgar and cheap anti-Semitism, about his mad belief that the Antichrist is, is with us now and is already here and is an adult Jewish male. He's trying to lay off that bet by supporting the ugliest and stupidest elements in Israel who think they can bring on the Messiah by stealing other people's property, uh, his shakedown artistry, his lying, his failure to levitate his ghastly tubby form into the heavens with the rapture. <laughs> instead being found slumped uselessly on the floor of his office in Virginia, uh, built on the, on the money uh, stolen from the credulous. And then I thought, well, I, I can go on in this vein for some time, but I'm, I think I really ought to say what I truly think about him. And I said, um, <laughs> now that he's gone, I have some advice for his grieving family. Give him an enema, you can bury him in a shoebox. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Good. Well, there was a brief pause, actually. Because they're slower on the uptake, as you know, in the South. Due to incessant offenses against chastity with members of their immediate families and um, domestic animals. No, we know, they're much smarter than you think. Much smarter than you think. There was a brief pause, and I thought, I've gone too far. No, no, then the roof blew off. They really liked it. They don't, they don't want anyone thinking that they are led around by idiots like this, by moral cretins of this kind. I think the zeitgeist is changing, ladies and gentlemen. I really do think it's happening, and we should be proud to be a part of it. Turn a page of your newspaper any day you like. See what the parties of God are doing to Iraqi society to drag it down to the level of Afghanistan or Somalia, the last two countries where... The parties of God had it all their own way. Look next door to Iran where people who believe in a tooth fairy figure called the hidden Imam, the 12th Imam, who, whose immediate advent is expected, which will, it won't surprise you to hear, bring about a reign of universal peace and justice when it comes. Wonder where they picked up that idea. But perhaps as a sign of a lack of confidence in this belief, Mr. Ahmadinejad is currently building a new boulevard into the center of Tehran on which to welcome the motorcade of this imam when he returns from his seclusion. Just in case that doesn't work or doesn't happen, um, why not pirate and plagiarize some nuclear weapons? They know nothing about science themselves. They couldn't do physics. They don't care about the beauties of science. They don't, the, the, the wonders of the cosmos don't appeal to them at all. But they can probably steal, uh, have stolen, the ingredients to make a nuclear weapon. So we now have what we've long feared we're going to have. <laughs> the coincidence between an apocalyptic uh, ideology and, a, or rather, shall I say, a messianic ideology and an apocalyptic weapon. It's going to happen now. It happened very soon. Well, suck on that for a second. 
I've already said what the crazed Messianic settlers in the neighboring or not far off West Bank are doing, and who their best friends in America are, the Falwellites and Robertson clones, who think it's amusing to try and propose that, with the help of sources I gather in Washington State, that stultifying nonsense be taught to our children in American schools in the year 2007 as equal time. So here, kids, uh, the chemistry class is over. Now get ready for the, the alchemy period. <laughs> Astronomy's over. You'll be glad to hear it's a hard subject. But cheer up. After the break, astrology uh, teacher will be on the scene. What is this nonsense? How can anyone put up with it for a single second? The, the evil attempt to make children ignorant and frightened. That <laughs> is also augmented very strongly by another priesthood, which has been teaching them about hellfire and limbo, though they've just dropped limbo at the last minute, uh, as the Pope did recently. You notice, limbo's over now. Unbaptized children don't go there forever in isolation and loneliness, after all, because they didn't get the sprinkle of water. You can relax. No, you can't. Millions of parents thought that's where their dead children had gone, ladies and gentlemen, for hundreds of years. Miserable, frightened, humiliated, upset. They believed it. It was real to them. It was cruel to tell them this nonsense to begin with. It's even more cruel to say, after all, that it's not true. But never mind. After hundreds of years of that, we have to apologize for a few other things, too. The Inquisition. Sorry about that. Um, the role of the church in the final solution. Maybe a mistake. Um, the Crusades, no, we wouldn't do it the same way now. Um, the, massacre of, the massacre of Byzantine and Eastern Orthodox Christians, up till the very recent past in the Balkans, we owe them an apology. This is quite a lot to be taking on, isn't it? But never mind, we're getting ready to be infallible all over again. This stuff is not to be believed. And you live in a country where you don't have to. Um, and mustn't be intimidated by the supposed strength of illusions like this or the people who peddle them. Uh, where I was very kind to mention that um, I recently took my oath uh, as an American citizen at the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. Actually, it was on the 13th of April, which is his birthday and also mine. And I'm, in a small way, his biographer. And I was able to arrange to take the oath at the Tidal Basin by his memorial. And I made a little speech about the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, which is the basis of the tremendous First Amendment to our Constitution that guarantees, as you know, that there can be no uh, clerical meddling in our public and political life. And uh, the shorthand phrase for that was uttered by the President in a letter that he wrote to the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, seeking refuge from persecution, from the Congregationalists of Danbury, Connecticut, by the way. It's who they were afraid of. Um, in which he said there will be a wall of separation <clears throat> forever on this point. So I now have a new slogan for you. Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I believe it's entirely possible that we can construct a cement here between what is patriotic, what is decent, what is rational, and what is not faith-based. I think it can be done, and I think it can start here. Okay, um, enough from me. What about my debating partner? What has he got to say to this? Well, uh, how would you be, Mr. Hitchens, how would you be moral if it wasn't for God? How would you know what morality was? What's your warrant for saying what's right and wrong? I always politely pause at this point as if I've never heard this nonsense before. <laughs> okay. So I am wrong when I get a sense of satisfaction from giving a pint of blood. It comes from nowhere. I don't lose the pint, I get it back after a cup of tea um, and lie down, but someone else gets a pint of blood they might very well need. A great little transaction, I don't do enough of it, and I have a rare blood group myself, and I might one day want the same person, or someone else rather, to do the same for me. But it's not just a utilitarian transaction. I positively enjoy doing it. Is this from nowhere? It's, I certainly don't know of any heavenly reason why I think it. All right, if that's not good enough for you. Um, by the way, give blood whenever you can. It's a noble thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And you may need some blood one day yourself. And you shouldn't be ashamed of the fact that this comes from human solidarity, without which we wouldn't be here in the first place or able to have a language to discuss this in. But all right. Think of my Jewish ancestors, such as they were, hobbling around 
um, in the desert. I don't believe a word of the story. Even Israeli archaeology has completely and conclusively disproved the story of Exodus, as is detailed at some length in my book. There was no such presence in Egypt. There was no exile. There was no wandering. Uh, there was a lot of massacre and, and murder and theft, but then there always is when uh, religious tribes are, are walking around. Let's assume the story is true. Let's assume it. Am I to be insulted by being told that my ancestors did not know until they got to Sinai that perjury and murder and theft were not kosher? <laughs> Up till then, they thought, those are the things we like best. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a facer to get all this way, and then do we have someone tell us that's not on anymore? No. No, we all have to, I'll repeat myself, we all have to have more self-respect than that. They wouldn't have got that far or anywhere. They would never have been written about or heard of if they'd been under any other impression. Religion gets its morality from us. We know innately. You don't have to teach a child the golden rule. You sometimes have to reinforce it a bit, but you don't have to teach the principles of it. Same with the New Testament. How do we know this? Because the story of the Good Samaritan is told by the alleged Nazarene in whose existence I also do not believe. But he talks of a person who went out of his way on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho to help a fellow creature in need. Very obviously, this man cannot have been a Christian because it's the young Jesus talking about him. He knows the story already. He's able to tell people that's the way you should behave if you see people in trouble. He never says you need divine permission to do this or a divine warrant to do it. It's ordinary human ethics. And to say that it wouldn't be part of us Part of our warp and our weft and our woof, if it wasn't for divine permission, is to make ourselves into serfs. So I propose we repudiate that and, as it were, <clears throat> stand on our own two feet a bit more. Now, speaking of serfdom, well, Mr. Hitchens, isn't it the case that in the last century some of the worst atrocities, if not the worst of all, were perpetrated by atheists and secularists? Is this not the fact? Very serious question. I have a whole chapter about it in my book. Shall I read it all to you? No, I won't do that. It's available at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> <clears throat> and will be available after this show, where I'll be very polite to anyone who has a receipt, <laughs> but not to anyone else. Someone asked me the other day, are you a materialist? I said, are you joking? Is it, this is America. Well, take the, take the cases that are before us, uh, the most notorious ones. In the case of fascism, the, the movement that coined the term totalitarianism, that actually put it into circulation, religion being, in my view, implicitly totalitarian with its admiration of an absolute unchallengeable ruler, there's no other way to describe the fascist movement beginning in Spain, Portugal, Italy, spreading through Croatia, Austria, large parts of Germany, Hungary, Slovakia, except to say it was a movement of the Roman Catholic right. That's what it was. It was a completely Christian movement. All of its leaders were believing Christians. It had a, an official concordat with the Vatican. The Nazi puppet state leader of Slovakia was actually a man in holy orders. General Franco was very nearly baptized in his rule. But anyone can look this up. The church has never ceased to apologize for it, and nor should it. And after the war was over, they helped many of these people escape and begin constructing regimes of a similar model in South America after 1945. No wonder they can't stop apologizing. Nothing secular about that. German National Socialism, not quite the same, I have to say. It's true that the Vatican signed a treaty with Hitler the week he was installed in power. And it was for him the first and most important treaty he ever signed, the Concordat with the Vatican and neither of them ever broke it. It's also true to say that in Mein Kampf he praises the Catholic Church and never left it, and has nothing but contempt for atheism. It's also true that the Pope ordered that his birthday, the Fuhrer's birthday, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, be celebrated from the pulpit every year, every April, which it was to the very end. It's also true that 25% of the members of the SS, this we know from Catholic historians, were confessing Catholics, ones who went to confession, and that no one was ever threatened with excommunication for their role in the Endlosung, as the Germans call the Shoah, 
or the final solution. Uh, excommunication was only used by the church politically after the war when you were told you couldn't, you'd be excommunicated if you voted for the Communist Party. And it is true that Joseph Goebbels was excommunicated from the Catholic Church. But do you want to know why? Do you know why? He's married a Protestant. Yeah. He's married a Protestant. That's what it took to be. <laughs> Next you'll know he didn't eat fish on a Friday or something. Um, no, excuse me, they have their standards, okay? <laughs> but it is also true that Hitler sought to replace Christianity as the state religion and would have preferred an Aryan Nordic blood myth with himself as the centerpiece of it. There's no question about that. And that many brave Christians had to die on that proposition. No one can deny that. But there's nothing secular about National Socialism. And of the third partner in that revolting alliance, that, that of Japan, the leader is not just a man of God, but a God himself, for whom people were prepared to immolate themselves and others. Um, the late Emperor Hirohito. While I'm at it, um, when his son was sent to Oxford University, this is a digression, but why not? He was sent to Magdalen College in the 30s, and um, the Japanese embassy sent up a team of people to see the, the warden of Magdalen College, Oxford, to say, are, are you sure you're ready to receive the crown prince. They say, yeah, we're absolutely, we're ready. He's got a nice room. We have a good tutor. Apparently his English is very good. We're looking forward very much to having him as a Japanese ambassador. Said, well, it's just we want to be sure you understand. You're calling him crown prince. Of course, that is his title. But you do, you do realize that um, his father in our country is not thought of just as an emperor, but as God. Do you understand that? And the warden of Magdalen College said, I think you'll find we're quite used to having the sons of famous people at Oxford. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> don't know what brought that on. <laughs> don't know quite what made me go to that direction. Anyway, there's nothing secular about an empire whose military ideology, by the way, was that of Zen Buddhism, for those of you who think the Eastern path is more contemplated. It's official ideology, as with the dictatorship in Burma today, uh, is Zen Buddhism. Buddhism. Uh, there's nothing secular about that. So I think that clears up this frequently asked question on that side of the ledger moving, still answering my own, not my own question, the other person's question. <clears throat> um, moving to Russia, until 1917, <clears throat> the year of the revolution, millions and millions of Russians have been told for hundreds and hundreds of years that the head of their state was also a man of God, the head of the church, was not quite human, a bit better than human, not quite divine either. The Tsar was the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. He was the little father um, as well as owning everyone in the country as an absolute dictator, he was the spiritual leader of the church. That's how millions of Russians have been reduced to credulity, stupidity, servility, and fear, thus the state of affairs. If you are Joseph Stalin, who'd studied for many years in a seminary to become a priest, and would have made a very good bishop if he'd stuck at it, <laughs> if you do not realize what an opportunity you've just been given with this vast reservoir, then you shouldn't be in the dictatorship business. Immediately, an inquisition is set up. Uh, heresy hunts begin. Uh, trials of heretics are uh, put on. Miracles are announced. Lysenko's biology will produce giant tomatoes and four harvests a year. Everything is to be uh, expected from the leader. All praise is due to him. All thanks are required of you. For him. It's not very difficult to see what the analogy is there, and I won't bore you with what happens in China, and I've already told you about North Korea. It's a simulacrum of, a borrowing of, and an inheritance from the willingness of people to take things on faith. Nothing, in my view, secular about that. Uh, to my questioner, I reply, sir, or as it might be, ma'am, Show me, if you will, a society that has adopted the, the teachings of Lucretius, Epicurus, Galileo. <clears throat> I'm talking of our great tradition of reason, skepticism, science, culture, religion, and, and, and um, irreligion. Uh, Galileo, Spinoza, Einstein, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Bertrand Russell. Show me a society that's ever adopted those values as its own. That's fallen into famine, dictatorship, war, cruelty, and persecution, and then we'll have a level playing field. But for now, thank you.
going to say, hold your applause. No, applaud more. Um, that actually, I think, will do for an introduction. If you don't know where I'm coming from by now, you're never going to know. <clears throat> it's, it's your turn, and I'm enormously, I really mean enormously grateful that you, that you came. Thank you. I wonder if someone else would like to point to questioners so, so you don't think I've um, planted anyone in the middle. But who would that be? Do I have a volunteer just to identify a questioner? Basically, my question is that... Uh, Can you speak up a bit? Sure. I don't have to um, American on. society, um, probably, a, it's considered more, a little bit more than Europe, is a society that faces tremendous flux and has um, for a long, long time. And I was wondering if, if that is perhaps one reason why um, America, you cited in your book, that American society is especially religious. I mean, it, it struck me that societies in flux, having to deal with that tremendous change, do people turn to religion uh, as an antidote to that change? And if so, that what, what sorts of things can, uh, not leaning on religion, what sorts of things can we do to substitute for religion in dealing with lots of change? Well, I think you're partly right, and uh, I think Alexis de Tocqueville <coughs> had it right also when he pointed out that the great thing about America is religion is a voluntary association. You can't be made to go to a church here. The government can't uh, finance one. I mean, where I was born, which you can probably tell was in England, the queen is the head of the church, as well as of the armed forces and the state. And on her demise, the instant of her decease, her slobbering, chinless dauphin of a son <clears throat> will not only become the head of the state and the armed forces, but the head of the Church of England. It's enough to make a cat laugh, isn't it? <laughs> and, and I have to pay tax, or would if I still lived there, have to pay taxes. To it. That's what you get when you found a church on the family values of fucking Henry VIII. <clears throat> Well, again, again, ladies and gentlemen, take it from someone who had to sweat and struggle to become a citizen here and go through Homeland Security and the National Security Agency, realize how lucky you are that doesn't apply to you. Somebody who wants to build a church here has to do it themselves and keep it going by their own efforts. And fine, let them by all means do that, as long as they agree to leave the rest of us alone. Now, on the point that you make about anomie, or if you prefer, alienation, that was the same point that Durkheim made very early on in his studies of these matters. A, a huge number of people in history are always having to make something like the transition from the country to the city, from the stable, ordered, rhythmic life that's determined by the seasons to the much more feral conditions of, of mass society. And that means many more lives will have to be experienced as failures, or at least as, as very risky. Um, my... my, my comprehension of this issue slightly stops there. What I've never understood, and it may be a failure of my imagination, is in what respect does belief in the tooth fairy help you at that point? After all, millions and millions of intelligent workers shrugging off the city, ex excuse me, <clears throat> shrugging off the idiocy of rural life and moving to the city have not run straight to a priest when they re run into a crisis. I don't see why people do it. I'm not sure that the explanation we give isn't a condescending one, as a matter of fact. Which, if I'm not babbling too much about this, would enable me to answer another question from my interlocutor that I failed to. What about how when religion makes people behave better? What about Dr. Martin Luther King? It's the one I always get asked. Shall I answer it now? It seems logical. Dr. King was an exemplary human being by every standard that I know. I can't be sure that he was actually a Christian. I can be grateful to the extent that he was not one, in that when he told his oppressed people that he was going to preach from the book of Exodus, about the story of the, the uh, enslaved who made it to the promised land, it's a very good thing he didn't mean it, because that horrible story says that the tribe he's leading are, it, are allowed, empowered in fact, ordered by God to kill everyone who gets in their way rape their women, 
massacre their children, sparing only the females of marriageable age, and steal the land and the property of any tribe they don't destroy or do. Well, just as well, that isn't what he was saying, right? Second, you'll remember that he was a student of Marx and of Hegel, and he was regularly accused, rightly too, in his lifetime by the FBI and by the reactionary bigots of keeping too many friendships among communists and Marxists and socialists, which he did. Uh, great black secularists now forgotten, um, like Baird Rustin, my favorite American socialist, and um, Philip Randolph, the great American black trade unionist, actually organized the March on Washington, had the idea, pulled the crowds together, brought in the trade unions to make it happen. It's a pity that we leave these people out of account, and I think it's condescending because I think that 90% of the white liberals in this country are in effect saying in a patronizing manner, well, you know, these black folks, they quite like a preacher. They like a preacher man, that's what they respond to. They like the pulpit. That's what they go for. So why not let them have it? Which immediately gives permission for the most gross charlatans and frauds who I've been debating in the last few months, like Sharpton and Jackson, to come forward and just pick it up as if it was theirs, with your, as it were, permission, and prove yet again that you can get away with anything in this country if you can put Reverend in front of your name. I guess we should just do it alternately, yeah. Um, your book was reviewed in New Yorker, and he, the reviewer brought up a point I thought you might like to address, if you haven't already, that if your view is, would the world be better off without religion at all, uh, he brought up the point that if we're wicked enough to invent religion for ourselves, then we're wicked enough to come up with some other alternative that's just as mischievous. True enough. I mean, did, did everyone get the question? Okay. Um, well, you know why atheists are to be pitied, don't you? They have no one to talk to when receiving a blowjob. <laughs> so, <clears throat> that if I'm asked, do I wish that religion would die out of the world, I, I sort of reply, no, I, I wouldn't have anyone to argue with. I mean, it is, after all, it is the original argument. Where religion ends, philosophy begins. Just as where um, phony cosmological myths end, uh, physics begins. So you have to know what the origins of the argument are. And religion is our first and worst attempt to find out what's going on. We only bother with it because it was here first. It, it grabbed the territory of explanation because we are pattern-seeking mammals uh, we need to look for patterns and for logic, and we, we prefer, even in times like this, many people will prefer a conspiracy explanation to no theory at all, because they need to have some explanation. Well, religion comes from the time when we didn't know there was a germ theory to explain disease. So it was plague, it was God's will, and it was a curse. Didn't know we lived on a round planet. Didn't know there were round celestial bodies. Um, didn't know that our DNA makes us uh, kin with uh, other animals and indeed plants. Um, so the study of it and the debate with it, I think, has to go on. I'm, I'm for, to that extent, I'm in favor of, as the president ludicrously says, teaching the argument about evolution. Because the way I learned it was by reading about the confrontation between Huxley and Wilberforce in London for, about the origin of species. Actually, it was in Oxford in the origin of species. Huxley was Wilberforce's opponent. Wilberforce was the Bishop of Oxford. Huxley was Darwin's best friend, the man who coined the term agnostic. They had a great debate, and Huxley mopped the floor with the spokesman of the church. That's how I know how the argument goes. And in America, admittedly, 50 years later, good grief, but still, the same argument happens in Tennessee, in a courtroom this time. And again, they lose. By all means, teach the argument in that way. You just can't teach it in science class. And by the way, if there's going to be equal time for this stuff, then every church that gets any subsidy from the faith-based initiative or any tax break has to teach evolution in Sunday school. <laughs> By law. <clears throat> um, 
As a uh, fellow uh, anti-theist um, uh, who is coming to believe more and more that you can't make accommodation with a pack of lies, um, I decided to give the other side a chance. And uh, at lunchtime, I went to a cathedral uh, right near here. And I saw some people who were uh, sitting there, and they felt they found a place where they didn't feel judged. And I saw two nice young men who were going over their, uh, the, uh, the ceremony for them to become priests and serve their community. And I went home, and I read a very charming little story about um, people in a Muslim village hearing the call to prayer and the high and the low taking off their shoes, bang, bowing their heads, and coming together. And as an anti-theist, I think it's, it's all very well to say, this is nonsense, what you believe. But what can we do to call the community together? H have you given that some thought? Sure. Um, good question. I mean, the, one of the things that um, annoys me about the the responses that I get sometimes from the faithful is that they say, well, all you, your theory means that love is only a chemical reaction, say. So, well, actually, I do think that there is quite a lot of chemical reaction involved in love and in some of the things that are associated with it, too. But it doesn't mean that one is merely a reductionist. I don't think at all that one must despise uh, the transcendent or the numinous. I wouldn't trust anybody who, say, listening to Mozart on a mountaintop in Cascadia at sunset didn't feel that maybe there was more to life than his own immediate concerns and that uh, all could be filled with uh, great compassion for other people. In fact, if, if this were not so, there wouldn't have been great secular for the men uh, like uh, Thomas Paine, for example, and Benjamin Franklin, who actually did found the American anti-slavery society, while every Christian in the world was justifying slavery from the Bible, where that justification can, in fact, be found. Of course there is extraordinary and profound humanism, and without it, where would we be? But I deny only that this is not possible without the fear of a supernatural dictatorship, and I will keep repeating that until the last dog dies. I also have a wager that I put to the religious in these cases. And you may be interested to know that I've tried it with everyone from the guy who founded Bush's faith-based initiative, Mr. Olasky, to various Baptist pastors, a Buddhist nun, a rabbi, charismatic Catholic, various pastors on radio and television all up and down the country, no, not yet an answer from them. It's simple. You have to name or cite a moral action performed or a moral statement made by a believer that could not have been made by an atheist. That's all you have to do. And it cannot be done. So your question is, in, is a nice one, but it's surplus to requirements. Comrade. One of your anti-God uh, competitors, Sam Harris, makes the point uh, as a primary thesis in his book, uh, The End of Faith, that real responsibility for the situation which you've de been describing is the tolerant religious person who will not take a uh, firm stand and uh, put down uh, uh, erroneous liberal prin principles. I just wonder wh whether you would put responsibility on the, the tolerant religious person as Sam Harris does. Yes, I mean, I'm a very great admirer of Sam Harris, even though he turns out to be a bit of a Buddhist. Um, <laughs> I mean, un, unlike me, he is a qualified neuroscientist, and he does think that there can be consciousness independent of the brain. And I'm, that's an argument I'm very interested in having. I, I doubt he's going to win, but I'm, it's a pleasure to argue with him, I have to say. By the way, what does the Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. <clears throat> Just quickly, what, what happens next? He gets a slathered hot dog and from beneath his saffron robes produces a $20 bill, hands it to the vendor, munches, nothing occurs. He says, where's my change? <laughs> you know what's coming. Don't you? Change comes only from within. Um, <clears throat> 
I'll give you an example of what I mean and why I think that those who criticize me for only taking religion at its worst say, well, you're right about the fundamentalists and the extremists, but what about the mainstream? I say this. Remember last year, <clears throat> the Danish case, where a huge organized attempt was made to destroy the economy of a small democracy in Northern Europe, Denmark, because its prime minister refused to break his own law, the law of his country, to censor cartoons in an afternoon newspaper in Copenhagen. With the backing of all the members of the Arab League, a boycott was declared on Denmark to try and sabotage its economy. Its embassies were burned, its diplomatic immunity was violated in countries where demonstrations are not normally allowed. <clears throat> Random Scandinavians, whether Danish or not, were set upon and murdered. There was a huge outpouring of mayhem and cruelty and bigotry that had quite clearly been very well rehearsed in advance. Bad enough, you might think. Not one media outlet in this country would agree to show those cartoons. In a time completely dominated by the image, my profession, I mean, totally dominated by images, much too much so, they wouldn't show, here's the picture or the pictures that, that all the fuss is about, nor would they show them as a gesture of solidarity to their Danish colleagues who were being subjected not to threats of death, but attempts to actually to kill them. And when a small magazine, and I know very well why this was, because I know the editors who took the decision, they were either extremely afraid of violent reprisal if they did their job, or, coming closer to your point, they were afraid of offending religious people. I'm not sure which of those decisions is the most cowardly or contemptible, taken in conjunction I think extremely contemptible. And a small atheist magazine for which I write called Free Inquiry did reprint the cartoons as a result of which Borders Bookstore pulled our small magazine from the rack. As a result of which I haven't spoken in a Borders Bookstore since I started this tour. Now, In other words, in the, in the heartland of free expression and constitutionally protected free speech, a complete, across-the-board capitulation by everybody and a discrimination against those who were willing to stand up against it. This is very severe. What did the Pope say? Seeing Danes being threatened, Danish economy sabotaged, Danish embassies burned, what did he condemn? The cartoons for being profane. That was the line of the Vatican. That's what our State Department said. It said it regretted the offense given by the cartoons. This is a fantastic surrender. It means the extremists have the whip hand, and we've got no right to say that in criticizing religion, we're only singling out the fanatical or fundamentalist majority. No, in the name of tolerance, you're identified for, for In the name of multiculturalism, uh, in the name of respect, in the name of all these things, uh, they were parodied and, a, and a, an abject collapse in, in the face of religious fascism occurred that I, for one, am not going to forget or allow to be repeated. Hmm. Muted applause for that. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> not to nudge you too hard, in the room. If you don't applaud, I can become quite morose. Um. <clears throat> Hurt, you know. Not upset, just hurt. <laughs> Sir. So over the course of history, what happened or what is in place that enables billions of people across this planet to believe that a book built by a process as intensely political as that of the Bible is the way that we should live our lives? And how is it that the same people can dismiss particular parts of the Bible, for instance, the book of Joshua? and still say that that book is the absolute authority, the word, the word with a capital W. Yeah, well, there's a good, the, the, there are possible, I think, decent anthropological answers to that. For a long time, it was the only book everyone knew. And for a long time, there was a heroic struggle, at least I regard it as heroic, to, ha to have this in incredibly important text, the only one everyone had in some way in common, translated into English out of Latin, so it wouldn't be the special property of a priestly class. And that's what the Protestant Revolution means to me, is, is John Milton, for example, and um, William Tyndale and the others who, who strove to get this book into the hands of the common people to demystify it, 
to make it into what it is, at least in its King James version, very great literature, as is the Cranmer Prayer Book. You probably know of the Lady Governor of Texas who, in the discussion on whether religious education should be bilingual in her state, said, well, if English good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. Um, which means that the Protestant Revolution succeeded even better than I had thought in giving this impression. Um, and English is the only language in which I have to say I understand the Bible, but for many people it's the only book they have either read or in many cases only read a bit of. Now what you get now as a result of biblical criticism and scholarship and also various vernacular editions of it that unlike the Quran have made it available to everybody in pretty much every tongue um, is people want to take it a la carte. They'll say I quite like the Beatitudes, I just don't like, and I, I don't mind um, uh, the story of the um, the rest of the story of the Sermon on the Mount or the miracle at Cana where water is turned into wine, my own personal favorite. Um, but I don't like the other stuff. And I don't like the book of Joshua, and I don't like the injunction to kill all the Midianites down to the last child. That makes me uneasy. Well, they're out of luck. This stuff is either the word of God or it isn't. And they have to make up their minds whether they think it's that or man-made. And when they've done that, they'll feel better. But the, the attempt to have it a la carte is to me contemptible. I keep finding on this trip when I debate people, I'd have to write a different book for every priest I debated. Because if you say to a Baptist, even in uh, Georgia, well, sir, you, you say you're an ordained Baptist minister and indeed a teacher of baptism at the local college, may I know whether you concur with John Calvin and his view of predestination and damnation? or not. May I further know if it, you think it applies to me, and if you don't think so, may I know on what authority you don't think it. They don't like the question one bit. They don't, and not because you're in front of an educated audience either. They're not sure what they think. They'd rather say, well, some of that's metaphorical. What's metaphorical about telling people that they, their fate was decided before they were born and they can't change it even by good works? Even by doing the right thing, won't change it. You were picked for hell before you were born, you're a goat, not a sheep. By the way, who wants to be a sheep? A religion that calls itself a flock, you already know a lot about. <laughs> they don't like it, ladies and gentlemen, they really don't. I say to the rabbi, so your daily prayers begin, don't they, by saying, thank God he didn't make me a woman or a Gentile, a goy. Isn't that, isn't that the prayer? Well, I don't always say it, okay. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. You come from a sect that doesn't shake hands with women, I'm not going to shake hands with you. I have views of my own about this, but I've told you what they are, and I'm willing to be tested on them and questioned on them. Why aren't you? Why do you want it a la carte all the time? This morning, the conservative guy, very nice, extremely nice fellow, on the local Fox radio, John someone. Yeah, extremely courteous, gave me a lot of time, and I said, well, for example, you know, I say to Catholics, um, they, you, come on, you, you may say you're a Catholic, you don't really believe in the virgin birth. He said, well, I do. And I thought, oh, Christ, that's the first one I've met the whole, it had to be this morning. <laughs> and I said, well, you, are you really saying you do? He said, yes, I absolutely do. I believe in the Immaculate Conception of Jesus. And I said, no, hold on a second. The Immaculate Conception is not the same as the virgin birth. He said, it isn't. No, no, the Immaculate Conception says that Mary was conceived without sin, without any stain, not that her son was conceived without the intervention. But bluntly, he had no idea. Didn't even know what he didn't believe. <laughs> it's come to something when a Catholic on Fox TV has to be told his, his, uh, his theology by me. And I hope he doesn't, I hope if he hears of this, he, he doesn't regard it as an abuse of his hospitality. I must say he was a real gentleman to me the rest of the time. So, who's up? Sir. Thank you. Um, earlier, when you first started speaking, you spoke about fascism. Um, I think it was Ame Cesaire who talked about uh, the relationship between colonial expansion and uh, fascism. S basically, he was stating that um, because of European expansion, uh, colonialist, that 
fascism was a result, and that's why they got uh, the rise of fascism in Europe. I was wondering what your thoughts were in that uh, the United States, all of our wars, except World War II, essentially, have been colonial expansion, and now we're seeing the disappearance of habeas corpus and our constitutional rights and torture and those kinds of things. I was wanting to know, particularly in lieu of your new citizenship, how you felt about that. Um, thank you. I'm an admirer of um, the work of Aimé Césaire, who the gentleman just mentioned, who was the, the great poet of uh, negritude, as it was called in French West Africa, um, under the time of Leopold Senghor, who was, his, I think, his mentor in this matter. And it's certainly true that the relationship between the rise of fascism in Europe and the decomposition of colonialism in Africa is a very intense one. Just to give you one example, the brown shirts of the German Nazi party were bought as army surplus from the Goering family, which had a huge estate in southwest Africa, now Namibia, where General von Trotter had first launched his campaign of extermination against the Herero uh, people before even the First World War, where they, they already had first the experience of genocide and second a lot of spare uniforms that could be used to fit out um, a horrible militia. And Mussolini's fascism was felt much more intensely in Libya and in the uh, gassing of the uh, people of Abyssinia, as it was then called, Ethiopia now, uh, than it was anywhere else. And you could make the, the British Union of fascists largely grew out of the black and tan movement that was an attempt to repress the people of Ireland. In interestingly, by the way, the Pope's uh, support of Mussolini in Abyssinia was partly because the, the Abyssinians were and are the oldest practitioners of Christianity in Africa, they nonetheless practiced the monophysite heresy, which was thoroughly condemned by the Council of Chalcedon in the year 524. So he had it in for them still on this point. <laughs> yes, you're right. As to the um, thing that you tack on at the end, I knew someone was going to try this. Um, <laughs> I'm only here to sell my book, okay? <laughs> but you do have the honor of addressing someone who is a named a plaintiff in the lawsuit brought with the help of the American Civil Li Liberties Union against the National Security Agency and against the Justice Department. <clears throat> which has so far carried in the courts saying that it is illegal and unconstitutional to listen to the telephone conversations of an American without a warrant. I'm appalled that when I wasn't even a citizen yet, I had to go to law to uphold that simple point. But we've won so far. But it's going to require a lot of vigilance to keep winning. The recent, I think, complete collapse of the Justice Department's witnesses and main spokesmen on other matters in front of major hearings in, in the Senate is, is extremely encouraging. It, it, I, when we brought the suit, we didn't know that people were gathering around John Ashcroft's uh, bedside trying to guide his palsied hand over this order. <laughs> Ashcroft, the man who says in this country, remember this when he was a senator, he said in America, we have no king but Jesus. A statement that is exactly two words too long. about liberation theology? It's a contradiction in terms. <laughs> what about the... The, emanci the, the emancipation of the human personality, the human mind, is from theology. There are no two ways about it. I don't care if I run into some priest in Colombia who thinks that Fidel Castro should be Pope. It bores me. It irritates me. I ask him the same question. Is there anything you're saying that an atheist couldn't say? that might be right or might be wrong, but would still be said. What's the theological bit for? No, Jesus doesn't have a special privilege for the poor. He says, render unto Caesar. Don't you believe that? If not, why go on as if you did? No, it's piffle. It's callow piffle. You've been waiting a lot longer than I have, so go ahead. Well, <laughs> toujours la politesse. 
You've, you've described many deeds of uh, a number of different evil gods. And I noticed from the title of your book that God is in very small type. And it is not capitalized, nor is it plural. I'm worrying, wondering uh, which god do you refer to? Well, the, um, the joke is partly on me, as you point out, in that, uh, but though I didn't say that God had committed any crimes, I wouldn't fall into that mistake. You see, by taking the atheist and anti-theist position, one avoids the dumb questioning that the faithful bring upon themselves. Why does God allow this suffering? I don't have time to waste on a question like that. Um, why was my buddy hit in the testicles and I escaped? <laughs> How did God allow that? God was not involved in it. Why do some people get swept away by the tsunami and others not? Because we live on a cooling planet, baby, with a turbulent weather system which has volcanoes and earthquakes. That's what decides what happens. It's, it, it, we, you can just spare yourself all this stuff if you don't quarrel with God and if you don't uh, try and indict him in this way. So I don't think he's ever committed a single crime or ever will. But that, but that he makes people behave worse, the belief in him does, I mean to say, I have no doubt. In other words, some, I didn't say enough about this perhaps at the beginning. It's not just that our ethics come from our own innate solidarity and decency. It's that morally normal people can be brought to do things that no morally normal person will do or would do, such as mutilating the genitals of a child, for example. I'm sure some people here have been handed a newborn baby in their time. Okay. What, none of you? <laughs> what have you been doing with yourselves? <laughs> no one here has had a newborn baby. Well, I recommend you go home and try harder. <laughs> well, I have. And if you're ever going to have that feeling, oh, maybe this is a miracle. If you're ever going to have it in your life, that's probably where it will be. Little indentations where the fingernails are going to be. It's heartbreaking, really. <laughs> if only you knew what was coming. But anyway, uh, it's a moment. So you get given this bundle. You think, well, OK, that's great. And, and it probably is a gift from heaven but I'd better find a sharp stone as quickly as I can and start sawing away at its genitalia. Because <laughs> otherwise it wouldn't be pleasing to God. No, no one, no moral person, is, or, and then when he gets old enough to listen, tell him that he's going to burn forever in hell if he doesn't obey some cranky instructions. Poison his life and his dreams. No, 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 this is not moral preaching. Um, so I'm... Uh, I'm sorry, I, want, I did want to add that before I, um, uh, before I wrapped up, uh, that it's, it's, it's the, Professor Steven Weinberg puts it very well, actually. He says, in a morally ordinary universe, the good people, decent people, would do the best they can to do right by their fellows. And the psychopaths and the sociopaths, those for whom society and other people don't really count, no, 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 will do wicked things. But if you want good people to do evil things, you need them to be religious. Weinberg is right. So what, so what you're saying is... Uh, Another unsatisfied customer. <laughs> yes. So what you're saying, uh, whatsoever is good and kind and just, against such there is no law. You, you'll have to have another whack at that, I'm sorry. So what you're saying is, is that whatsoever is good and yes. kind and just, against that there is no law. Whatsoever is good, well I think I'm recognizing an epistle from St. Paul here. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, yes. think on these things. Yes, I read that at my father's funeral as a matter of fact, yes. in the D-Day Chapel in Portsmouth, where Eisenhower had prayed for good weather for the invasion of, of Normandy? What if the weather had been bad? What if heaven had been indifferent in that moment? Don't ask. These things happen. And if, if there'd been a divine intervention, we wouldn't have had Nazism in the first place. Um, no, the, I don't really understand the grammar of your question. What I'm saying is there is no law against goodness, and apparently that's what you have been describing to us. I appeal, ladies and gentlemen. 
of the jury. I mean, have I been saying that there is no law against goodness or that there is one? Hmm? Well, you're in good company. Thank, I mean, thank you for trying, and if I've seemed obtuse, um, you're, you're, you're quite welcome to blame me. Hi, uh, my name's Tyler. I hope I'm not the only former Christian from Yakima. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, much like the South, Yakima is. Um, uh, two quick questions. One, I read, I read the review of your book from your brother, and I just want to know, I'm curious about your relationship with him. I, that's as far as I know, as that he didn't like the book. Uh, and secondly, um, some recommendations from you more of um, influential anti-theists coming up besides Harris, Dennett, Dawkins, and uh, others. So, okay. um, Well, concerning my, my brother Peter, who is um, a very distinguished uh, ultra-conservative columnist and, and broadcaster in Great Britain, and a very strongly believing Christian, um, all I can say is there's probably one in every family. <clears throat> As to the ranks of anti-theism, the, the best book, I, you mentioned Professors Dennett and Dawkins, who of course are great scientists and great explicators of science, and great educators, and Sam, who we've, I've already talked about, and we're beginning to be, it's very, very flattering to me, mentioned in the same breath as the some say musketeers. I would prefer, I think, horsemen of the counter-apocalypse. Um, <laughs> but there is another one. Well, there are two of the bestseller lists now. One is the woman who I had as my witness and friend at the Jefferson Memorial, Ayan Hershey Ali. Some of you will know. Her. Unbelievably courageous, beautiful woman who has survived with great humor and, and dignity and courage everything from forced marriage to gentle, not just mutilation, but infibulation too. And, and, and who thinks that she's probably the only girl born that day in that hospital in Somalia who's still alive, and probably is, but who's now a wanted person uh, on the run, seeking political asylum in the United States. Not even Holland is safe enough to hold her from the fury of people who, to whom her existence is an incitement to murder. And not just murder is on their mind either, if you want my opinion people who are obscene and filthy, as well as uh, murderous and lethal, and so entitled, so sure of their entitlement to murder because they have God on their side. Well, she was the one who stood next to me at the ceremony, and her book, Infidel, is a marvelous book, as is The Caged Virgin, its previous. And then the extremely tough and impressive uh, Dr. Victor Stenger, who's written a book called God, The Failed Hypothesis, in which he will go further than I, I will say that it is impossible to disprove the existence of God as it is impossible to prove it, thus that those who say they can know what cannot be proved can be excluded from the argument. Those who are certain where certainty is impossible are easily dispensed with by Occam's razor. That's as far as I feel I need to go. Stenger says that the evidence from science is now strong enough to say that it disproves the existence of God. And he certainly demonstrates in his book that every hypothesis for God's existence that is science-based has um, been utterly overthrown. And I may say I'm sorry that no one from the Discovery Institute came this evening because I trailed my coat as much as I could <laughs> while I was in the hood, or that if they're here, they've kept quiet. Um, but Stenger is a great book, and he's a huge addition to the arsenal of argument. I'm told we've got two more, right? Sir. Uh, what would be your rebuttal to the uh, review of your book in The Nation, which said, uh, if you are to be believed, our faith-based president is defending rationalism against religious intolerance? Well, my book doesn't say that. <clears throat> Daniel Lazar, the semi-literate polemicist who's always hired on by The Nation when I publish a book, for some reason, would, would be at a loss to point out where in my book I say that. Um, I attack the president for his credulity and stupidity on, on matters of religion. I will say this, however, 
um, which is what he may possibly have confused it with. It could be that every member of the 82nd Airborne Regiment was a Bible-believing, snake-handling Pentecostalist, uh, though I doubt it, but it, that, that could be literally true, and it would still be true that they're defending the frontiers of Afghanistan and Iraq from the parties of God. So the irony, I think, would be at, my exp at the president's expense rather than mine. These people guard us while we sleep from the worst enemy our country and our civilization has ever had, and I'm very proud to be among their supporters. Pity about the poor thing. Since there really are any, yeah. can we make it two more? And then one each, and then we're done. Yeah. Actually, how's that? Yeah. Fair enough. So you first, sir. Okay. Um, what would you say to the argument that uh, since we don't know what will happen after death, it's better to took the, take the strategy that you believe in God, because then if you die and there is God, maybe you have a chance of going to heaven. Whereas if you didn't do that, you yes. Know, well, you'll like that section in my very moderately priced uh, book. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> which, as you, most of you will know, uh, the gentleman is, uh, is summarizing actually almost perfectly the wager of Blaise Pascal, whose pensée, his thoughts, were addressed, actually, to the one who is so made that he cannot believe. That's me. And he says, well, look at it like this, like some huckster. Like the guy who, from the megachurch the other day on the radio, tried to get me to pull into his parking lot because the the Lord had cured his daughter of Hodgkin's disease, like some really low rent character says, what do you got to lose? Um, if it's not true, uh, we're all headed nowhere in any case, but if it was true by any chance and you'd said you thought so, ah, how bad could it be? <laughs> well, you talk about the way that religion degrades argument and degrades dignity and self-respect, there you have it in one syllogism. <laughs> But I have my answer, the following. <clears throat> on the assumption that the God they're talking about is anything like the one they ought to be believing in, this is what my, I say in my book I'm gonna say. By the way, but just before I tell you, you know what Bertrand Russell said in reply to the same question? He said, I should reply, oh Lord, you did not give us enough evidence. <laughs> um, <laughs> which I think is pretty good, but I might, my reply goes on just a fraction longer. It says, I presume, um, divine sir, that you have some respect for intellectual honesty and for moral courage, and that you would look with more favor on somebody who made an honest profession of unbelief than on someone who acceded to belief in you in the hope of a handout. Mr. Hitchens, I don't have a question. I have a thank you. Oh. I'm the executive director of Doctors Opposing Circumcision based here in Seattle. Excellent. And <laughs> and I send the thanks and greetings of my members around the world. Excellent. Uh, I am so tempted to leave it like that. But something, something in me wants to milk the moment, just one more second. If you will consult my reasonably priced volume, you'll see. You learn a lot when you write a book like this. I thought I knew what the case against religion was. I did know that, but I, I learned more than I thought I would. And the, the thing that really alarmed me was to read what the original justifications for circumcision was, particularly, were, particularly the horrific propaganda of Maimonides, considered to be the greatest Jewish sage. This is wicked stuff. And it says that the reason it must be done is for the same uh, reason as it must be done. Jews don't say this, fortunately, but as others later said to little girls, that to try as far as possible to make the sexual act as weak and unpleasant and the sexual sensation as is possible with the continuation of, of human life. It's this that takes the ax to the very root of our existence, our dignity, our self-respect. I'm pointing in the right direction. Our core. <laughs> core, ladies and gentlemen which means it's why it poisons everything and why the time to start fighting back against it would be right about now. Thanks very much.